Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. It's time for this week's episode about the defense. We're going to be doing this episode solo tonight. We're going to talk about the lopsided win over the Broncos. Exciting game. Good game for the defense. Great game for the offense. Lots of good things to say about this. A uh, lot of get right in this game for the Baltimore defense. So that was uh, nice to see here. Uh, lots of success on fourth down. The Broncos had one of five on fourth down. They had six of 14, which is probably not great, not terrible. It's just okay. Uh, Not a place the Ravens defense is used to being, but a step up from where they were for the first eight weeks of the season. So um, from that perspective, at least a a, a good thing. Uh, The cornerbacks back for the most part in this game. They were healthy. Uh, Humphrey played well. Seem to be on a limited snap count in this game. Uh, Wiggins and he each got a little bit of time. I thought Wiggins played very well. We'll get to some of that a little bit later. But uh, nice to have the cornerbacks back. Other changes in the secondary because Marcus Williams was back. Not only did he did he, he play, he started, made a big play on the very first play of the game. Nice uh, flying in tackle on a uh, play to the right side. Uh, where he stopped him for gain of one, no gain, whichever it was. It was a very short gain anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, it was nice to see him back. Nice to see him looking like he wants to really play football. Um, throwing his body around, and and that's uh, exactly what the Ravens need, is they need more players um, who throw themselves around, make tackles on the edge. It can't be only Kyle Hamilton doing that. That uh, just is not a good thing for a, for a football team. So anyway, that was really, really positive. Uh, They lost snap count pretty badly in this game, largely because they gave up some long drives to the Broncos. uh, And, you know, several of their drives ended on fourth down on the Ravens half of the field for their drives, in fact. Um, And some of them ended up pretty close to the end zone. So they ended up with a lot of wasted yardage. Okay, so they didn't they didn't get the typical. Uh, redraw value of the punt to give them a little bit of the the, the extended value to their drive in terms of the exchange of field position. Um, and they ended up, you know, giving the ball over the Ravens at the one yard line once. And uh, again, I think at the, the 14 or so after, after uh, an incomplete in the end zone, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, from that perspective, a, a good game from the Ravens from the perspective of losing snap count, this wasn't a great game to do it because the interior defensive line, was still extremely shorthanded. So they dressed five for the game. That included Matabike, Washington, who was hurt a lot of the week and finally practiced on Friday, which, by the way, if you've been to practice on a Friday, it's a walkthrough practice. They literally, they they walk through at a fraction of normal speed to make sure that people... The, the players understand what the footsteps are, how they you know pace themselves through their movements um, for the plays they have installed. So it's it's a um, it's a you know, half speed quarter speed practice, maybe half speed for the offense sometimes, maybe a quarter speed for the defense because they're not really trying to defend anybody. They just want to show the offense kind of the, the the look that they're presenting and have the offense kind of kind of play off that. Uh, uh, what else we have to talk about there? So anyway. The, the Washington returned at the end of the week. Matabike is the one guy who's actually healthy on this team. Um, his effectiveness is limited without either Pierce or Jones. We'll have to get into that a little bit later. But they brought up two guys from the practice squad. That's Wormley and Tupo, uh, guys who had, who Wormley obviously been with them years ago, but this was his first game of his second stint with the Ravens. So obviously had probably a big day for him to get back on the field in Baltimore. Um, uh, Tupo, who played a number of years with the Bengals and, uh, the Ravens signed him. I think they actually cut him on an injury settlement at the end of camp. And then they just re-signed him now. So that's a fairly rare double there that you get a guy back after, after cutting him on injury settlement. So, uh, they did. And, uh, and he's, uh, uh, he was important uh, to the Ravens. He ate up a lot of snaps between them. They played 30 and 27 snaps. Um, this was not a game. For the Ravens to allow 68 snaps, but hey, here we are, 68 snaps allowed, and uh, that was a lot of defensive line snaps that were included in those. Um, so uh, they worked through it. Um, Matabike and and um, 
Washington largely were paired together in this game. So they got the maximum value they could out of that pairing. And those guys played uh, uh, quite a few snaps. And I'll give it to you in terms of the non-penalty snaps here because that's what I have in front of me. Um, but Washington played 41 and Matabike played 46. So that's that's a heavy single game workload for a defensive lineman. Defensive lineman, rotational position. You want those guys to to be playing um rather than playing a percentage of the snaps, I'd say to be playing 30 or fewer snaps per game is probably optimal. Uh Wormley had 30 uh, 28 snaps and Tupo 25 of the uh and it was 30 and 27 if you include the penalties. So you know, a little more wear on those guys. And frankly, a little bit more wear on those guys is okay because presumably either Urban or maybe another interior defensive line will come along and those guys will not be needed to take that same uh, snap share on Thursday. Uh, we, we certainly hope that's the case. Um, Jones uh, active did not play even a single snap. Uh, I will tell you, from my point of view, that is the guy who is missing from the Ravens' pass rush right now. Without him on the field, in the middle, commanding double teams, Matabike's effectiveness is greatly reduced. The other players have to face doubles where they normally wouldn't. Um, and if you just look at what happened to to both Tupo and Wormley in this game, they consistently got single teamed um, pretty much the whole game. So those whoever um was was bubbled to one side was looking to help the tackle as opposed to um take an extra block on the inside the other thing it means is that you end up not needing to use your eligible receivers as often to throw chip blocks or to stay into block on on, on a set basis and that really reduces not only the effectiveness of your of your pass rush but the opposing passing game gets to run more productive routes because of that so big hamstring to not have jones in there he's a uh, he's a very key player pierce is a substitute for him who is pretty good and he certainly he you know start the year last year in 2023 it was michael pierce driving the pass rush from the inside and doing a great job of it and then as the season wore on jones became the guy who who would play more of the obvious passing downs be paired with Matabike more often, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this was also the first game in a very long time that nobody other than the Ravens big five has played even a single defensive line snap. So the five-man combination of Jones, Matabike, Pierce, Urban, and Washington played every 2023 snap, and they played all of the snaps in the first eight games of 2024 as well. So you have to go back to 2022 to the last time somebody outside that big five rotational group has even played a uh, a single snap. That's a really amazing streak to go 25 consecutive games with five guys sharing every defensive line snap. I, I doubt that has happened many times Oh, with a 3-4 defense. We'll put it that way. And the Ravens obviously don't put three men on the field, too, uh, three defensive linemen on the field too often. They almost always play two. But uh, they they sometimes play three. I'm going to tell you, in this game, they played, I think, slightly over two per play. Let me just count this up really quickly. Yeah, they had 140 spread across 67 real plays. So they played slightly over two per play. That was due to some jumbo formations they got into around the goal line. Unfortunately, you know you don't want to spend a lot of time down in the, down in those formations, but they they're, they use a lot of defensive linemen when you do and and. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that in the packages section a little bit later. Uh, we talked about Williams, great play, uh, you know, a highlight real tackle really in the first play. Uh, and then right after that, Ardarius Washington collects the tip off, I think it was little Jordan Humphrey, uh, and uh, hauls it in for his first interception of the year. He's obviously had some some much better chances in interceptions that he hasn't converted, but really nice to see the combination of Ardarius Washington and a tipped football uh come together with uh, a positive result there for the Ravens. And and uh, he's he's a player who I think looked really good in this game. He was on my list of, I think, honorable mentions. I put him for the MVP, but I'm not, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you now because then it'll spoil the surprise for the, for the end of the second episode. But anyway, he played very well, I thought, um, and uh, had several kind of highlight uh, drive ending uh, plays two of them anyway and then uh, uh, a couple of the good plays in coverage as well so very happy with what he did and he's playing strong safety he's not 
probably completely familiar with the position even now, but I didn't feel like there was a coverage breakdown in this game. And obviously there were coverage breakdowns with Eddie Jackson. Um, we didn't really talk about that, but Eddie Jackson uh, rode the pine in this game. Actually, not even true. He was inactive for this game, uh, which left uh, uh, Williams back taking the free safety role again, and then no strong safety for plays where they want Hamilton up near the line of scrimmage. So it it became the job for Ardarius Washington, who didn't play any slot corner in this game, uh, to do that, and, and I thought he played very well. Uh, and then the rest of the back end, they had Mollette playing some slot corner again in this game. You had three corners on the outside. Stevens played essentially every snap on that right side. He did get replaced, I think, for the last series. And then you had um, uh, Wiggins and Humphrey sharing time at left corner, um, and again, I thought Wiggins Wiggins played pretty darn well in this game as well. I thought Humphrey did. Humphrey was fine. Uh, Wiggins played really well in the game. Uh, what else do we have to say? Let's uh, let's move on. Talks about some other general thoughts about the defense in this game. It, it was a solid game in terms of effectiveness for the run game. Again, if you take out the six for thirty six that Bo Nix had, they were down to three point six yards per play. For the non QBs, they did allow six first downs. Now, some of those were by Knicks, and I don't know whether it was two or three, but some of those were Knicks. Um, and uh, he honestly did a, did a good job against their running backs. I would say that's that much more impressive in a game where you're down linemen. But the Ravens, uh, you know, one of the things that's really good about them this year is not just the run stopping, it's more fundamental than that. They are a great tackling team. And I mean a great tackling team. They are so far ahead of every other team in the National Football League in terms of their missed tackle rate. It's not funny. I have some numbers on that a little later that I'll get to. But um, it, it, you know, it's, their run defense has been great. But fundamentals are always more portable in football. So if you're good at something that's at, at, that is a, at, at, that's the root cause of being good at two other two or three other things that's more valuable and you become better at, you know, yards after the catch, for example, you become better at, you know, reducing receiving yards in general. If you make quick tackles, usually it means you can get to the, get to the um, uh, trigger more quickly downhill to get to a player who's closer to the line of scrimmage. And the Ravens certainly have players who are, who are very comfortable doing that. Um, and then they, they, you know, the inside linebackers just had a tremendous year in, in terms of uh, not missing tackles. I've been talking about Roquan's big, streak of not missing tackles for quite some time now and he had a, a streak of 59 in a row that did finally get stopped but uh in addition they've got uh now um uh trenton simpson on a on a great run of missed tackles and again i have some additional data for that we'll talk uh talk about later uh they missed five total tackles in the game so 7.4 percent that's terrific it reduced their missed tackle rate for the entire season to 9.6 percent that's using the pff Missed tackle definition, which is extremely strict. So you, you, there are missed tackles when you're basically lunging at the other guy's ankles sometimes, which seems quite unfair for a missed tackle sometimes. In fact, Ardarius Washington was charged for one on PFF that I probably wouldn't have graded it that way. But it's just easier to talk about their missed tackle numbers um, in the way uh, they do because from week to week, I don't want to be kept keeping a separate total of something that's uh, uh, this like this. So I, I do appreciate the way uh, that they do it. And I, and I trust that it's, it's done consistently. Um, they have the highest tackling grade by PFF. Now there's something to that. And they're probably basically saying that the missed tackles may have a minus a half, or they may be a minus one, um, there's different grades, obviously, of missed tackles. I've talked about that before, about how, you know, if you retrack a runner, particularly in the backfield, that might not be a bad missed tackle at all. In fact, it, you may actually gain from that. If you miss a sack, you oftentimes can gain more yardage on that particular sack because the quarterback gets away from you, drifts further back, and then gets sacked anyway. Um, uh, you certainly can have good things occur by missed tackles in the backfield. Missed tackles down the field they, or, or on the edge, they can cost you. So you really don't want to have them happen in the secondary. You don't want to have them happen in level two. Um, you really want to have them happen right at the line of scrimmage or in the backfield if if they're going to happen at all. And you had a better chance of of them not being costly under those circumstances. Anyway, Ravens have, have now missed 9.6% of their tackles for the year. And just give you an idea. 
The tackling grade, er, wide margin between them and the Steelers in terms of the tackling grade, is about eight points on that PFF scale that's from one to 100. Don't put too much stock into that, but I don't anyway. But I will say this, that the the Steelers have a 10.4% missed tackle rate. So it's significantly higher, almost 1% higher. But more than that, the 2023 Ravens, by comparison, and that was a triple crown defense, remember. Okay, so they led the league in sacks. Now you're thinking back, and you're probably remembering a few missed sacks on missed tackles, and so am I. I can think of a Clowney flipping off a couple and maybe Urban picking them up. I, I could away admit certainly slipping off some, some uh, uh, sacks. But uh, that team had a 13% missed tackle rate for the entire season, despite being the 2023 Ravens triple crown defense. So anyway, the Ravens currently at 9.6%. It's a tremendous number. It probably will not continue at quite as good as it is right now. Um, but it's something to really appreciate about this defense. And if you look at um, what Orr has done this year, a lot of things haven't gone right. Things in the secondary haven't really been schemed up great. There's things about the pass rush I'm, I'm concerned about in terms of um, how that's schemed. There are some things about ex- um, aggressively going after variants on defense that I'm not very happy about, but the team can tackle. And when at the heart you could do that, then you can take chances on some other things like send additional players into the backfield to try and either run blitz or to, to go after the quarterback on plays. Um, you got a better chance of not really getting burned as badly on the back end. And I think in general, obviously, and we've said this many times on the show that um, defense must seek variance to get the offense off the field. So you really, you have to you have to not just be okay or amenable to average level plays. You need to aggressively seek variance, force opponents to try and hold you to to create penalties, force opponents into bad decisions where they may turn the ball over. Um, you know, get them for negative plays like sacks, like tackles for loss, uh, and get them force them into quick incompletions, which may end drives. So particularly when you're playing three down football. That last one is very important. When you play four down football, it becomes less of a useful strategy. You really have to go for negative plays, penalties, and turnovers um, once you're getting into it into a spot where the other team's in four down football. So, uh, you know, with all that's gone wrong, let's at least take a moment to say that I think Zach Orr has had a very positive influence on the tackling on this team. I could see how it would be true because he was a good tackler during his career. Um, he's certainly a guy from, from that perspective that I'd want to have that fundamental race. And if you, the fundamental value from, I'd expect that fundamental value from. And he's also, that's also a reason why I wouldn't want to let him go without significant thought about the thing. All right. Now there's been all this talk about should we just let Zach Orr go in the middle of the season? It's it's conceivable that Zach Orr is not ready for the job he has, but he's ready for certain aspects of it. And you know, he's he's certainly you know the, the fact that he's brought this this tackling to the Ravens. I have to give him credit for that and say, boy, let's see what else he can come up with. Um, and I think they don't really have the proper guy, which is unfortunate, to be the guy in his headphone to take more risk. Dean Pease, he had some good adaptability in terms of trying to figure out what the opponent was, but the weakest part of Dean Pease as a defensive coordinator was his willingness to take additional risk for additional gain on defense. The guys who have been great about that in Ravens history are Rex Ryan and Wink Martindale. Those are the two. Uh, and they all the others, they had various levels of, of not really wanting to do it whether you're talking about Lewis or Nolan or Pagano or whoever, um, and they had great individual players, certainly in particular when the when the Reed Lewis defense was here, there wasn't really as much need to take as many chances. They still did, but they, there, there wasn't as much need to do it. Um, but the the those are the two guys who I would like to have indoctrinating or into the ways of variance seeking defense. So uh, I know he he played for Dean Pease. He probably really likes Dean Pease. Dean Pease is the right age. Dean Pease is not employed currently. Uh, you know, Rex Ryan's working for a network. I don't know if he'd want to come out of retirement to, to work for the Ravens or, or frankly to work for Harbaugh because there might still be a little bit of aggravation there that Harbaugh kind of took his job in 2008. Uh, there is certainly some feeling on the Ravens from Ray Lewis who said some unfortunate things at the time saying that, 
it was really Rex Ryan and not Harbaugh who was the coach in 2008. I don't really believe that, but there were there are some things um, about Harbaugh where I could have seen that being true from a player's perspective because Ryan, very much a player's coach, and uh, uh, he'd he'd be a guy I think who could uh, who could help this team take more risk. All right, what else we want to talk about? Um, yeah, let's talk about Tupo and Wormley for a minute because the two of them came up, played a good number of the total snaps, maybe about 40% of the total defensive line snaps were those guys with 60% going to to uh, the big two. The big two, now Broderick Washington's part of the big two under this new injury system we have here. But uh, those guys played about 40% of the snaps. I thought they played pretty much as well as you could reasonably hope. Um, anybody you pick up this time of year, and Tupo is just this week, um, is going to be at a lower level than what you'd be able to get earlier in the season. So the, you've heard me probably say this on the show before, but the replacement level drifts downward at every position, but more sharply at the size and shape positions, and defensive line is that, um, as the season moves on. So health is very important to those positions, which I think really benefits rotational teams over teams that like to, you know, like the Steelers, who who just try and get a ton of snaps out of Cam Hayward and Tuit and players like that, and even going back to Aaron Smith and Kiesel and others. Um, they always tried to get, I thought, too many snaps out of their uh, top defensive linemen, which meant that they were more susceptible to injuries. Well, anyway, the Ravens have gotten themselves into this point. It's obviously very unfortunate what happened to Pierce, what happened to to Urban, um, who, who we hope will be back soon, and so of course what happened to Jones. Um, but you know they they are a team who should suffer less of those injuries, and they had a remarkable twenty five game stretch where they basically didn't have anybody hurt. They they only had one inactive all of last year, and that was Broderick Washington for one game. Uh, this year, they'd been playing with fire, having four defensive linemen active for for several games. I think this might have been, um, I think it might have been four games before this week, and so this was really the fifth. When you consider the fact that Jones wasn't really able to play, uh, no, this actually might have been the fourth. Jones wasn't really ready to play last week, and they did play him some. Um, so anyway, it's it's a uh, it's it's not a thing you want to go into, and it's an NFL game with only four defensive linemen, and the Broncos really knew how to attack that. So the Broncos used a sixth offensive lineman. I believe it was 10 snaps in this game, which is an awful lot for one football game. Uh, Normally, you know, you see Cleveland and I look at his offensive line chart for the year. He's really only played as a sixth offensive lineman until this last week when he got a a little run at one series at left guard. But uh, he's, he's played like one or two snaps per game. But in this case, they had... The guy was Pert, who came in. He played 10 snaps, 14% of the snaps as a sixth offensive lineman. So Sean Payton knew, hey, the Ravens are short. If we run the football, if we go short ball control drives, their defensive linemen are going to get tired. They're not going to be particularly effective in the in the second half. And fortunately, Lamar Jackson and the offense had the answer for that and uh, and knew how to get the score run up in a hurry and in a position where – even if they wanted to run the ball, it still wouldn't have been optimal because they would have been just eating clock to do so. That third quarter where the Ravens uh, had a couple of touchdown drives and the um, uh, Broncos had six total plays and zero first downs to the Ravens 12, that really sealed off any risk that the defensive line was going to be in trouble. But for the first half, it did not look good, folks. The offensive line had played a lot of snaps. I think Peyton probably, uh, even though they went into the um, one and a half time uh, trailing, I think he probably thought we got, we still have a chance to win this ball game. This holiday season, find the perfect gift and spark something special with Uncommon Goods. No need to stress, Uncommon Goods makes shopping easy with hand-picked, unique gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Think gifts that bring out the smiles, the laughter, and that, yes, it's exactly what I wanted moment. They scour the globe for one-of-a-kind handmade remarkable items, and they always seem to know the perfect gift. I got these Camden Yards drinking glasses on it that have a nice etch of Oreo Park and the skyline around it. Check out their new officially licensed NFL collection for you Raven fans. When you shop Uncommon Goods, you're supporting small businesses and independent artists. Many of the products are made in small batches, so make sure to get yours before they sell out. 
with meaningful gifts from personalized items to special finds for kids, sports fans, and book lovers, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone. Plus, for every purchase, they donate $1 to a nonprofit. Over $3 million donated so far. To get your 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash ravens. That's uncommongoods.com slash ravens for 15% off. Hurry, this deal won't last. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Game. If we can just keep leaning on them in the second half. Ravens came out, of course, scored a touchdown the first drive. They went three and out. And then the Ravens came back on the field and scored another touchdown. And the lights went out. But it was a, uh, uh, you know, it was an opportunity at that point for the for the uh, uh, Denver to uh, to still be in the ball game. All right, let's move on. We'll talk a little bit about packages now. Now the Ravens played some packages they haven't really used very much, and actually some not at all. And I, I know every time I have to enter a new line for a package type that I never expected to come up, um, it's it's always kind of interesting. But this this time it was. A four-three-three-one package. That's a package with four linemen, three outside linebackers, three inside linebackers, and only one in the secondary. They played that for two snaps down by the goal line. They played one other version of the jumbo, a more common four-two-two-three look. Um, those four plays. Now remember, they're they're all run from the one or two yard line, but those four plays gave up zero yards um, and very importantly zero touchdowns. So zero net yards and zero touchdowns. They did give up one total yard. They got got the the Broncos from the two to the one on one drive. Uh, and they did eventually give up a fourth and two touchdown on one drive where they used jumbo, but they were very effective at keeping the, keeping the Broncos out of the end zone with that package. They played base for seven snaps. Again, these are, these are times when Pert would have been on the field. It would have been um, very difficult to stop the run. Had they had not had, had they not had an extra interior defensive lineman on the field. So they, they really had to do it. And they're very effective, 15 yards uh, with the base defense on the field, 2.1 yards per play. I, I'm going to say that uh, Peyton really didn't get the payoff that he hoped to get from going to that sixth offensive lineman. So they, they tried it. They really tried to lean on the Ravens, but uh, the Ravens run defense held up pretty well to that. And that, uh, and that was good. They played 30 snaps of big nickel in this game. Of course, that's with Hamilton used as a slot corner. Washington doesn't have to be, but it is in this in this game. Washington, it's at uh, strong safety in this case, along with Williams on the back end. And then they had multiple corners that they that they hadn't played. But those big nickel snaps also effective. 30 plays, 141 yards and 4.7 uh, yards per play. They played the standard nickel 17 times. A standard nickel is uh, as a corner at, on the at slot corner instead of a safety at slot corner. Um, so in those plays, Hamilton was moved back to the back end. We had Mallette in at slot corner, 17 snaps, 3.9 yards per play. So very effective in, in those positions uh, uh, with whichever version of the nickel they played among big and standard. Now they did play nine snaps of rush nickel. Now, What's rush nickel? Rush nickel, they put three outside linebackers on the field and only use one defensive lineman. In a game like this where you're short on defensive linemen, critically important to conserve your defensive line snaps. And did a good job of that in this game, um, they, but they allowed 10.8 yards per play on those plays. And that was Tavius Robinson you know, being kicked inside. Davis Robinson, wow, that was a game that he had. And some spectacular oddity to the Ravens pass rush in this game that we'll get to that's all centered around Tavius Robinson <laughs> and, and what he accomplished with some late sacks and quarterback hits, but they did give up 10.8 yards per play with that rush nickel on the field. Um, they did try one snap of dime, but it was negated by penalty. And then they put Simpson back in. Um, so otherwise they, they really were a committed nickel team the entire day. Uh, and we'll, I would guess probably see that again versus Cincy, given how well Simpson played. However, I wouldn't be surprised if they change it if it's not working out. Um, Burrow is a, is a, going to be much more effective than Bo Nix was at taking advantage of the players on the field. Uh, their receiving um, weapons are going to be more effective at doing that as well. And I think they may... If they're trying for a lot of throws between level two and level three, it wouldn't shock me to see Hamilton go back and they're playing more dime again. Uh, they have exactly enough personnel 
pretty much right now to do it. Uh, if they lost somebody, they start to get very stretched in that position, particularly if Humphrey has to play every snap and um, uh, it has to move to the slot to play some. Um, it becomes you know more difficult for them to figure out exactly how they would do that. If they brought Eddie Jackson back, they'd have the players. I don't know that they'd have the quality. So you know they've they've got some choices to make about how they want to do this. Simpson playing extremely well right now um, is is a is just a, a, gives them an extra option they didn't know they had before. Uh, they played these five straight games of dime. They went five and zero in them. They played three other games uh, where they hadn't played any dime, basically two snaps or less, and they lost all three of those. Of course, this was a game where they um, uh, didn't uh, play dime. And yet they won. So this was the first trend breaker after nine games. And I, I posted a little thing about this in, uh, in Twitter, on Reddit. And somebody on Reddit correctly says that correlation does not equal causation with regard to the dime. The thing that I would say about this is I'm not getting at the two snaps of dime versus the 20 plus snaps of dime. What happened in those games was they chose to have the dime be their pass defense in all the ones that it was 20 plus. And then they played more of it when they got a lead in those games and were, and were leaning on the lead or sitting on the lead um, in the, in the games they didn't play dime, they decided not to use the dime as their basic passing defense. Um, and one time it was out of a personnel shortage. Basically that was when Williams was sitting and, and Eddie Jackson was the free safety against the Browns. Uh, but the, but the other uh, times, the first two games of the season, or had just come in with the notion that they'd be a committed nickel team and they didn't. They hadn't really used the dime. And, and then when they did, um, they basically turned to it on all passing situations. It'll. I don't know if we'll ever hear if the decision to make that move from committed nickel to dime was an or decision or came from higher up, like Harbaugh, um, or or maybe a discussion with Dean Pease or however it might have occurred. But um, the decision to play dime really worked out, um, and now. You know they've got a they've got a valuable Trenton Simpson who looks like could help them uh, even on passing downs and uh, they came up with a a, a great uh, delayed late sack um, when they were down by the goal line and and uh, had real value to to uh, effectively put an end to a drive. It brought up fourth and fourteen, but uh, he he played very well and and I think they have options now. They could they can do different things. They might. They might stay with the committed nickel, wouldn't surprise me, or they might go back to the dime if they felt like that gives them best chance to win against Cincinnati. So uh, hopefully at least this the process of going through and playing a fair amount of dime at least puts it puts the tool in the shed for or that he can use it either way and, and be successful either way. Because I think Hamilton was was just fine playing that dime role. as, um, uh, uh, and, and I think it's a matter of really getting their back end shored up which we'll see if they have done over the course of the next several weeks with what I assume will be Williams and our Darius Washington playing that slow split field roles. So it's Williams will be the free safety and then Williams and Washington will patrol the back end on obvious passing downs. At least that'll be the, the starting look they show. Um, and then they'll do whatever they, whatever they choose to do in terms of rotating out of that or playing matchup zone. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that, um, how that plays out. All right, let's move on a little bit. We'll talk about the pass rush now. And uh, I think we're going to get done with this episode in record time, but there is a lot to talk about on this pass rush. So the big story here in this game, the, the um, Broncos threw the ball or got sacked on 38 plays. All right. The Ravens allowed ample time and space 22 times. That is 58% of the time. Now, if you, uh, I'll give you a few points of comparison, but I normally say in the high 20s is kind of a standard. I'd like the Ravens to be no higher than that. You know, d- defensively, I'd, I'd like the Ravens to be higher than that offensively. Uh, that's, you know, obviously the way you want it to go, but in the high 20s would, would be pretty normal. Um, what was good about the 22 plays that went for ATS is that the Broncos only got 143 yards on this play, six and a half yards per play, which is about two yards below what they should do on those plays. Eight and a half would be my standard. They got six and a half, 44 yards below standard. Now here's the weirdest number maybe that I've ever seen in terms of the pass rush. All four of the Ravens sacks came 
on an ample time and space opportunity. So that means Bo Nix was sitting back there patting the football for six, sorry, for three full seconds, each of those plays where he eventually got sacked. And it's not like there's no pressure by three seconds on any of those four sacks. Okay. So not, it's not like, you know, the sack we saw by Simpson where he's been run all run around all over the place before Simpson finally comes in to make the tackle or, or, or what happened on a couple of the, the sacks by uh, both sacks by, um, Robinson, where he chased him down or even got him on, on what was being converted into a run play. Uh, it, th- these were a matter of, you know, he's basically all alone there, can't find anybody in the secondary. Now, it, 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 here's the weird thing about this. That that obviously is a terrible thing for the pass rush to give up 22 ample time space opportunities. Um, it's a damn good thing for the secondary that they can turn those into four sacks and only six and a half net yards per pass. I mean, that's that's not very good. You will not win games if you, well, maybe you would win games if you got 100% of your <laughs> 100% of your plays as ample time and space and got 6.5 yards each, but it's it's not a good number. It's it's well below the standard for um ample time and space. So, that was that was the really bad number. Ball was out quick only 6 times the entire game, 16%, very low number. Usually you get pressure, pressure kind of competes with ample time and space. And if the pressure number is winning, then the, then the ball out quick number will go up because the, the, the offensive coordinator will call more quick passes to get rid of the ball. But anyway, the ample time space number was just fine. They were winning that ample time space versus pressure number. So the ball out quick number was, they were never incented to get the ball out quick properly. They did it a few times, but they, they were never really incented to do it, uh, to set up plays that were, you know, screens and slants and whatnot. Um, but anyway, they, they mixed it up a little bit. 24 yards on those six plays, um, which is also bad. That's about two yards below what you'd expect and uh, 12 yards below additionally for, for the game there they lost. And then it's actually happened to be the exact same as last week. 10 plays for 30 yards with pressure. It's only 26% of the time they got pressure. Way, way, way too low. Um, and 3.0 yards per play on those plays. So five yards below the standard. Not good at all. Uh, in total, um, Nick's underperformed his opportunity set by about 51 yards. He had 197 actual yards. That's net. And that was 200 against 248 expected yards. So we saw, we were watching the same football game. You saw Bo Nick's overthrow receivers in the end zone who were open. Uh, he certainly missed some opportunities to, to throw scoring plays. Not, not that Jackson didn't miss one or two himself. Um, that's about it. That's about all he missed, and a couple were dropped in in this game. But uh, he certainly has missed missed a few the, the the last few weeks. But this was a game where, where honestly, they got a lot of unforced errors from Bo Nix, and I think that affected Orr's decision to scheme with the combination of numbers and pressure, which is what I'm going to get into next. So before I do that, though, I want to just say, I want to give you a point of comparison on the 58% ATS, the 2023 Ravens for the whole season, allowed 26% ATS. So less than half of the ATS percentage in this game. So that's the difference between triple crown defense and what the Ravens have now, which is which is pretty darn bad. The 58%, though, by, by far the worst of the year. Um, the Ravens might have been over 50% against the Browns, or it might just have been close. But in, in either case, this 58% is by far and away the, the highest. All right, let me take just a moment here. One of the difficult things about doing this show solo is you need to take a break to take a drink of water or just to, to take a moment to rest your voice for a second because uh, no one else is doing the talking and you don't have the, the privilege of the of the mute button. But anyway, uh, nice. Uh, let's move on to the to the to the number of of pass rushers used. So. They used seven pass rushers, sorry, five pass rushers or more on just seven snaps. That's 18% of this total snaps by the uh, Broncos. That's a very low number. They sprinkled in a little bit of deception, which I'll get to. Um, I think the deception and the numbers were less than I would have expected given who they had playing on the defensive line. When you have Chris Wormley and Josh Tupo in there, you better have some other way to get pressure is a nice way to say it. When you have... Frankly, have Matt Abike and Washington in there, you better have an alternative way to get pressure too. Because those guys, Matt Abike is not nearly the player he is when he doesn't have Travis Jones or, or Michael Pierce next to him to 
eat up that double team, nor is the rest of your pass rush as likely to get home from the edges. So uh, this was a case where where I was a little bit surprised, but if I had to, to point to a reason why it occurred, why there was less pressure and less use of numbers, it was because Orr felt like he didn't really need to. They're getting good enough results because Bo Nix was making a lot of unforced errors. And um, I think if people say, well, that won't work in the playoffs, this is one time when that bullshit line is probably actually true. Uh, normally, I just I get really tired of people saying, that, like like any any Joe on Twitter really knows what will work in the playoffs and what won't. At least give, give your entire set of reasoning. Don't just tell me that won't work in the playoffs is what, I, what I'd say on this. But anyway, this is one case where better quarterbacks would pick apart um, what the Ravens did in terms of pressure would make better use of the ample time and space um, they had. So it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a bummer that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, uh, uh, it's good that it worked out this way, but it's a bummer that they probably can't replicate this for future times or, or it won't obviously be replicatable. I wouldn't try it with Joe Burrow, by the way, I definitely, um, this Thursday, I expect the Ravens to be trying for much more, uh, variance and embracing that in, in a bigger way. I'll give you the numbers actually for each pass rush group, just so we'll go through this quickly. Uh, when they rushed four, they never rushed three. They rushed four 31 times, 162 yards on this place, 5.2 yards per play with three sacks and the one turnover, the interception by Washington. They rushed five, five times, 41 yards, 8.2 yards per play. They rushed one six times, ending in a six yard sack. Uh, and they rushed seven one time, ending an incomplete. So the five times they rushed five plus, which is the typical definition of the blitz, was five point two yards per play, which was the exact same that the four yards per that the four man pass rush gave them, five point two yards per play. So I I don't think Orr was wrong against Denver and Bo Nix. I'm just not sure it's it's replicatable um, that they'd be able to do this. Uh, the three sacks and thirty one. Attempts is very good for the four-man rush, by the way. Always nice to get that. The fact that they were all ample time and space means, again, that's also not likely replicatable. Let's talk a little bit about deception as well because they had some limited uh, deception this game. Seven off-ball blitzes out of 38. All of those were singles, 0.18 per play. Uh, They gave up 38 yards on those plays, 7.6 yards per play. They also had one sack. Now, remember, against the Browns, when they were blitzing, they had some success getting home. Or Darius Washington might have had a sack, or he came close, or got a pressure. And who else? Hamilton had a sack. So they they did some positive things to get to the quarterback um, with odd man rushes coming from off ball. So those those things are, um, you know, I think the Ravens are going to have to reconsider them for, for the game against Cincinnati because I think that it'll be important to generate that variance. All right, stunts. Now, stunts, we've had this discussion a number of times on the show, but stunts can be called on field or they can be called off field. When they're called off field, um, they uh, you know usually are run within a specific set of linemen off and tackle end uh, stunts, but they ran only two stunts the whole game, which tells me a couple of things. First of all, both the passes were incomplete. Second, they were obviously making an attempt to cage or funnel rush Knicks. So they were trying to maintain the pocket integrity as a big part of what they did. One thing about stunts, they confuse opposing linemen, but they break down pocket integrity. That's the trade-off you're, you're getting. They also take a little bit longer to develop. Um, that would have been okay in this game, by the way, that taking a little bit longer to develop, it still would have been effective. But it, it's pretty clear that or put the kibosh on any stunts called on field in this game. And he said, guys, we, we need to maintain pocket integrity. So no, no deciding on the field, no rock, paper, scissors to figure out, you know, how you're going to set up a stunt on a play. You got to, you got to play it the way we, uh, uh, we call it from the sideline. So anyway, those two stunts, both did end up in incomplete passes, but didn't end up being a meaningful component of what the Ravens tried to do in this game. They did use simulated pressure four times. Now in theory, I guess a quarterback like Nick's, Simulated pressure is a pretty good thing to do because it'll it'll hopefully confuse the quarterback on where his hot reads are exactly, and you might be able to to, to make a play off that, uh, and you also might confuse the offensive line. Now Denver has a good offensive line, so they're going to be less likely to fall for the bait 
in terms of simulated pressure events. Um, they dropped four guys, sorry, four times. They dropped two or three from the line of scrimmage. Those plays did work pretty well, four yards, 1.3 yards per play. Um, it's not that they didn't work. It's just I, I wouldn't expect them to normally be tremendously successful against this group. And against Knicks, you you could end up with him finding some hot reads. Um, Nick's a very accurate college quarterback, so I think he'd be able to read some of that more accurately. But they always say pro game moves a lot faster. You have probably less in the way of mistakes to to, to uh, fall back on. And I don't know how well the Broncos schemed up their attempts to get a hot read um, on a play by play basis. So you, in, in some ways, you've got to kind of be looking for it. And if you're if you're Peyton Manning or Drew Bre- or uh, Drew Brees or um, uh, Tom Brady, you know, 10 years into your career, you know, every hot read, hot read as soon as the guys line up for it, you know, Ben Roethlisberger, Patrick Mahomes, same thing. You know, they'll, they'll shred you if you, if you try to do a lot of simulated pressures with against a rookie, that's a time when, you know, simulated pressures can, can be effective. They may not really take advantage of hot reads. And I don't know how, how complex they're making the calls or how well Bo Nix has adapted to reading it at the NFL level. It randomly one play the entire game with two plus elements of deception. Okay, an incomplete pass, fewest of the season by far. Um, they might have had a two or a three in another game, but normally that number is four, five, six in that range. Uh, and, and when I talk about that, it means maybe a simulated pressure and a stunt, maybe a stunt and a blitz, maybe two blitzes on the same play because that would count as ready, maybe two stunts on the same play. Um, that play used to be called Double Twist Willie in X and O football, if you ever played that back in the 1980s. Um, but they have multiple ways they, they, they can try and do it. And, uh, uh, they just didn't do it in this game largely because they really wanted to shut down the stunts and they really reduced the blitzes. They did some adapting at halftime, uh, because they had been successful at stopping, uh, or Nixon had, had made some mistakes and they'd been good at stopping Denver without, you know, rushing numbers and doing crazy stuff. They had five of their seven blitzes were in the first half. So in the second half, um, they ran only two and they had one of their two stunts in the first half. And um, looks like simulated pressure was two and two by half. So no big difference there. They did have a lot more ample time and space in the second half, big strings of, of ample time and space, uh, including this is pretty incredible. Seven ample time and spaces in a row at one point during this game. So anyway, very different opponent they'll face in Cincinnati, and I think they'll look at that in some different ways in terms of how they uh, want to embrace uh, variance in that game. All right, really appreciate folks listening. I- I'll uh, be coming back to the second part of the show again solo, and uh, we'll talk about some individual player performances, and we'll get into uh, some other goodies like the MVPs from this game and a very deep set of mailbag questions, which is good. I like to have mailbag questions, especially when I'm doing the show solo. That makes things a lot easier. I uh, want to act, tell you folks, I really appreciate uh, the listeners tr- tremendously, uh, particularly using hashtag film study mailbag. When you put a tweet out there and you're asking me a question, um, don't send me a DM with that because I can't sort that normally to find your mailbag question when the chips are on the line and I'm in the middle of the show and I need to find it. So people have been sending me questions on Reddit. I have a very difficult time with that in terms of getting them to them as mailbag questions. I have to kind of cut and paste them, but it's a, it's a difficult, it's a more complex thing for me to take care of uh, there. And you can have these for any of the shows. If you have a question about a matchup show, I'll get to the question with Frazier. If you have a question um, for Voss uh, that you want us to talk about on Friday morning GM, Love to have it. Um, hit us up there. And if you if you just have it on the normal offense and defense reviews, mostly we would assume that anything that doesn't obviously fall into the other categories will take care of there. Uh, thanks again for listening, and I'll talk to you next time on Film Study. <laughs>